So good morning, everybody. Um, I'm really pleased to welcome you all to the official scientific press conference for the 27th Harm Reduction International Conference. Um, my name is Naomi Berkshine. I'm the executive director of Harm Reduction International, and we're really pleased to be the convener of this event, bringing together a thousand people from close to 80 countries around the world. Um, I think I speak for everyone here when I say there's been incredible energy around the conference center over the past few days. It's been so exciting to be reunited post-COVID. Um, at the same time, we're, you know, we have a really exciting kind of body of evidence and research being presented. Um, kind of broadly adding to our renewed optimism in the field, perhaps cautious optimism, but renewed optimism. Um, we see some great policy progress around the world, uh, whether it's developments in places like Thailand and Malaysia, um, our harm reduction services implementation in a number of countries in Eastern and Southern Africa. Um, yesterday, we were really excited uh, to have been part of the first ever media tour of Melbourne's medically supervised injection room. Um, we we're accompanied by Commissioner Helen Clark, Chair of the Global Commission on Drug Policy, um, and had this incredible chance to really kind of take the, the client's journey through the centre. Um, interacting with the, the clinical staff, but also the peer experts that, that are there to support people um, when they use the service. Commissioner Clark said on site yesterday, we need more of these rooms in Melbourne, Australia, and across the Tasman. The medical supervised injection room has been granted permanency by the Victorian state government, and the basis for that is largely due to the public health benefits of the centre, um, the evidence base. So today we're going to hear about some other spectacular new evidence and research being presented this week at the conference. Um, and this data we think is critical to inform decision makers going forward. On that le note, let's get started. Um, let me just quickly run through some housekeeping. Um, this press conference is live in person, as you can tell, because you're here. Um, we're going to, thanks to Ishvan, we're going to grab it and put it online immediately afterwards, and people will be able to see it on, on the HRI YouTube channel and on the Drug Reporter page. Um, today we'll be hearing brief remarks from all of our speakers, talking about the research they're presenting here this week, um, and then I'll open the, the room for questions. When you do ask a question, please indicate the media outlet you're representing and who you'd like to direct your question to. Um, okay, with that, let us begin. Um, our first speaker, I'm delighted to introduce you to Bezad Hajari Zada, an associate present, pr professor at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. Bezad's work ha is under review in the Lancet Global Health, and here he'll recap for us some of the global data around people living with hepatitis and their access to a range of health services. Bezad's data is, uh, is linked to the research project recently um, presented and published by Degenhardt, the systematic review in Lancet Global Health. Please take it away. Well, thank you very much, Naomi. And uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I would also like to start with acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land that we are gathering today and pay more respects to elders past and present. Uh, as Naomi said, <clears throat> this is actually a part of the larger project which is led by Louisa Dagan Hart and Jason Gribley, uh, with many people involved and I think I'm just lucky enough to present the data uh, for you on behalf of all my co-authors. Uh, this is based on a systematic review that we conducted looking at the, to evaluate the coverage of testing and treatment for hepatitis C and HIV among people who inject drugs. We collected data from uh, peer-reviewed literature, uh, just gray literature, which is non-peer-reviewed uh, data resources, and also contacting with uh, many uh, experts and stakeholders around the world and then putting together all the available data to develop some estimation. Uh, in terms of the HIV testing, the proportion of people who inject drugs who were tested for HIV antibody in the past 12 months, we had the data available from uh, 67 countries and the, the global estimation was 49%, which means that 49% uh, of the global population uh, who inject drugs, they were tested for HIV antibody in the past uh, 12 months, then less than half of them actually, they, they, uh, they got tested. With a very uh, wide range across the countries with less than 1% up to uh, more than 80% in uh, some other countries. In terms of the HIV treatment, 
the data was less available. Only 18 countries, they had the, the data of the HIV treatment. Then because of the insufficient data, we could not develop any kind of a global estimation of the treatment uptake. Uh, but the range was very wide, from 3% to 82% across the countries. That was the proportion of the people with, uh, with living with HIV who received treatment. Uh, in terms of the HCV antibody testing, uh, we had the data from 49 countries, and uh, the global estimate was 47% which means that 47% of the global population who inject drugs, they have ever tested for HCV antibody. Again, less than uh, half the population. Again, with very wide range across the countries. But for HCV, there is an important uh, point to mention is uh, there is a difference between HIV testing and HCV testing. In HIV, HIV antibody testing is more or less equal to HIV infection. And the people with HIV antibody testing, that's the, pe the person who is infected with HIV. But for HCV antibody uh, testing, that only shows the HCV exposure. Then a person with HCV antibody positive has to do another test, which is called HCV RNA, which shows the active infection. Uh, and that's actually uh, uh, where the very limited data, the HCV RNA testing, we had only data from three countries across the world. There are very, very limited uh, data from uh, in, in, in that uh, aspect. And in terms of the uh, HCV treatments, again, very limited data. The data was from 23 countries only available. Uh, again, not enough to have a kind of uh, global estimate, but the range was very wide, again, between 2% to 89% uh, uh, across uh, countries. Then the, the overall message is that definitely there is a gap, a real gap in, in terms of the data of the treatment and uh, testing for hep C and HIV, particularly for H FHCV RNA testing and also for the treatment. Then uh, even in the countries with available data, there are really suboptimal coverage in the majority of the countries. Then the, uh, firstly, there are uh, more investment and effort is needed for uh, development of the quality data in terms of the treatment and testing, and also more uh, strategic uh, interventions to improve the linkage of the people who inject drugs to hepatitis C and HIV care to improve their testing and uh, treatment uptake. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bazad. Um, and just to really emphasize uh, what a significant academic endeavor it is, these systematic reviews come out once every five, six, seven years. Um, so it's really very exciting for us to have Bazad and his colleagues uh, presenting the, the latest research at our conference. Um, our second speaker today, really excited to introduce you to Karen Timmermans. Karen is a technical manager at Unitaid, which is a global health agency. Um, and today we'll be making an important funding announcement in relation to hepatitis C. Thank you very much, uh, Naomi and Harm Reduction International for inviting Unitaid uh, to speak here today. Um, we know, and we have heard it in the conference before in the past few days, that people who inject drugs are profoundly and disproportionately infected and affected by hepatitis C. It is estimated that about four out of every 10 people who inject drugs have active hepatitis C infection, which is frankly enormous. And we've also just heard that the coverage of these people with testing, their access to treatment, in as far as there is data, is, is really problematic. It's way too low. I have also been very impressed in this conference in the past few days um, with what I have heard and seen about the leadership and the engagement um, that Australia is taking in this area. And I feel that there are many lessons that we and perhaps the whole world can learn uh, from Australia's pioneering role in harm reduction. But I also note that many of the tools and approaches that are helping to achieve a very welcome change here are not available to people in low and middle income countries 
where some 80% of the hepatitis C infections occur. So that is why I'm really pleased to be here today um, and to be able to announce on behalf of the Global Health Agency UNITAID um, that a new investment of 31 million US dollar that will be focused on preventing and treating hepatitis C in among low in sorry <laughs> in people who inject drugs in low and middle income countries. The funding will support efforts in 10 countries uh, to do three main things. We will pilot the introduction of long-acting buprenorphine. We will boost or try to boost the use of low dead space syringes. And both these products are really promising products that can really help to prevent bloodborne infections such as hepatitis C, but also HIV um, when, when injecting drugs. And then the third important thing, thinking back of your data that, that we will do, is um, we will also aim to make sure that really highly effective hepatitis C medicines that can cure hepatitis C will reach people who inject drugs in these countries. And we aim to do that by integrating testing and treatments in harm reduction settings and in other spaces and places where people who inject drugs feel safe to go, learning from what we see here in Australia. The first product that I mentioned, long-acting buprenorphine, is a new extended release formulation, as, as we call it in technical language. Uh, it's a medicine, so buprenorphine is a medicine that is used in opioid substitution therapy, and it reduces cravings and it reduces withdrawal symptoms um, for people. The long-acting formulation is an injectable formulation that can last one month, as opposed to the normal buprenorphine, which is an oral product that you have to take every day. Um, this new product is already being rolled out in high-income countries, in, including here in Australia. But so far, people in low- and middle-income countries do not have access to that product, with the exception of some people in Ukraine. The second product is low dead space syringes. Um, these are safer syringes, safer injection projects, products. Normal or traditional syringes, I don't know if you've ever paid attention, but they have like a small reservoir, like in the tip, where liquid or blood can remain, even if you press the plunger down completely. Low dead space syringes are slightly different because the reservoir is much smaller. So the quantity of blood that can remain there is much less. And therefore it reduces the risk of transmitting bloodborne diseases um, when needles and syringes are being shared. Early research in high income countries has shown that these products can reduce hepatitis C transmission by about 76%. And we think in UNITAID that this is also possible, that these products will also be effective in resource limited settings if they can be rolled out there effectively. So the work that we will support will try to do those things, but it is also really important for us that the support will really put the voices and the preference of communities, of people who are injecting drugs at the center. And we will really be guided by their needs and by what they want and what will work for them. The projects will be, the work will be implemented through three complementary projects led by Frontline AIDS, Medicine du Monde and PATH. And it will take place in 10 countries. These countries are Ukraine, Vietnam, India, South Africa, Tanzania, Nigeria, Egypt, Kyrgyzstan, Armenia, and Georgia. And through these efforts, we really aim to address the different factors that restrict access to 
and use of these products in low and middle income countries. And our ultimate aim really is to kickstart efforts um, that enable scaling up of these products in low and middle income countries to benefit people who inject drugs in those countries. Thank you. Amazing news. Thank you, Karen. Really, really exciting. Our next speaker is Marie Joffe Rustide. Marie is a researcher at the Institut National de la Santé et de la Research Medicale in CERM in France. Marie is presenting some really exciting new data, um, a controlled study of drug consumption rooms in France, significant um, in its you know, very first of its kind. Um, and she'll also give us some insights into some social science data um, unpublished at this point. Yeah. So thank you, Naomi, and uh, thank you, Harm Addiction International, for inviting me today. Uh, I will present some data on behalf of my co-authors, and this afternoon uh, I will be able to list all the names of people who have been involved um, in this work. So some, I will begin for, with uh, some elements of context. So drug consumption rooms have been implemented worldwide in Europe, Australia, and North America. And the first drug consumption rooms opened in 1986 in Switzerland, in Bern. And since this first uh, drug consumption room has been implemented, we have a lot of data that shows their efficiency on public health and public safety outcome. But despite this evidence-based extensive literature, drug consumption rooms are still difficult to implement in several settings. That's a case in Australia because they are facing uh, uh, difficulties to implement some new drug consumption rooms, but that's also the case in my country, France. So in my country, France, in um, 2016, the French government decided to implement two drug consumption rooms, one in Paris and another in Strasbourg, and it was 30 years after Switzerland. And the French government decided to implement only two rooms and for an experiment for five years. At the same time, the government requests my research institution to evaluate, again, the effectiveness of drug consumption room and their social acceptability in the French context. So we did several surveys. So uh, we did a cohort survey called COSINUS that I would present this afternoon that was a 12-month prospective cohort of people who inject drugs. We recruited 664 uh, people who inject drugs in four cities. And the methodology was original because it was the first time that we were able to compare two groups, a group of people who benefit from the services, from, from, um, from the drug consumption room in Paris and Strasbourg, and a control group in Marseille and Bordeaux who was not able to attend a drug consumption room. So the result of our cohort survey confirmed that drug consumption rooms are an efficient harm reduction measures that achieved to reduce overdose events, to reduce syringe and paraphernalia sharing, to reduce injections in public space, to reduce emergency department visits, to reduce abscesses linked to injection, and also to reduce criminality reported by people who inject drugs who attend drug consumption rooms. And this court was also completed by different social science survey that I will present briefly now. So we did an ecological survey before and after uh, the implementation of the Parisian drug consumption room. And with this survey, we showed a large decrease of discarded syringes in public space in the area where the Parisian drug consumption room is implemented. Uh, the number of discarded syringes was divided by three. We did that with the ethnography. We achieved this result with an ethnography uh, study um, combined with a modeling study. And data have not been already published. Uh, the poli we also analyzed policy administrative data combined with semi-structured interviews with police officers. And all this data highlighted that the Parisian area where the DCA has been implemented is not um, anymore considered as a problematic place in regards to public order, criminality, and safety issues since the drug consumption rooms have been implemented. 
So we also uh, conducted um, semi-structured interviews with people who inject drugs, who attend drug consumption rooms, and they reported that they considered drug consumption rooms as a protective refuge and also as a place where they felt being respected as citizens. And finally, we did a media analysis on drug consumption rooms controversy in France. We reviewed 2,000 press articles from 1990 to 2018, and we found that the voice of the French people who inject drugs were 30 times less represented compared to politicians, and 20 times and, and 10 times sorry less represented compared to residents. Our semi-structured interviews and ethnographic data uh, also showed that the implementation of drug consumption rooms in France is framed in a welfare state philosophy. The French state considers that it is its responsibility to manage public safety for residents and also to improve the health for people who inject drugs, but unfortunately to a lesser extent. The French state imposes at the same time a prohibitionist drug policy regime and as a consequence, a focus on punishment, surveillance, and a moral approach of drug use. And that's why drug consumption rooms implementation is still controversial in France. And since 2016, we have no new drug consumption rooms that has been able to be implemented despite the willingness of local actors. So for the future, to conclude, for securing the dissemination of drug consumption rooms in France and abroad, we need to change our drug policy model. We need to integrate drug consumption rooms in a more comprehensive approach with access to stable housing for people who inject drugs, social inclusion, treatment of mental health and trauma, empowerment of people, we need to reinforce mediation actions with local residents in order to decrease drug consumption from social acceptability. And finally, we also need to stop the demonization of people who inject drugs imposed by prohibitionist drug policy regime. And we also need to listen to their voices and to their experience of drug consumption rooms. If we want to improve the effectiveness of drug consumption rooms, we also need to act to, on structural levels by reducing precarity and stigma of people. And we also need to produce new indicators of drug consumption rooms with evaluation um, that will um, take into account social support, mental health, and we also need research more embedded in community-based approaches and during this year, I will lead a research program with the European Monitoring Center of Drugs and Drug Addiction to produce new models of drug consumption rooms evaluation with the collaboration of harm reduction providers and uh, people who inject drugs representative in Europe. Thank you. Thank you so much. Really exciting to have such a significant contribution to the evidence base that drug consumption rooms are working for both the clients that they serve and the communities around them. Um, uh, New York City opened its first drug consumption room at the end of last year. Really exciting move for the United States. And they will be providing a, presenting a, the results of a, some similar research uh, later this year. So it's worth watching out for that one too. Really pleased to introduce our next speaker, Nilawan Pitak Panawang. Nilawan is a member of the Thai Drug Users Network and is also representing Development of Quality for Life Lahu Association. Today, she will describe an extraordinary program delivering methadone to, to hard to reach villages and isolated places in Thailand. Thank you, Nilawan. Okay, thank you. Okay. I would like to say thank you, Naomi and uh, Michael and uh, Asia 23 committee to invite me to here. And today I would like to talk about mobile telephone, uh, mobile methadone me uh, therapy for drug users within ethnic groups in Phang district, Chiang Mai, Thailand. Yes, the northern region of Thailand bordering with Myanmar is known for several ethnic populations like Lahu people, Karen people, Akka people, and Padong people, and more. Yes, you can come to visit our Thailand and uh, especially Chiang Mai province. Ethnic, ethnic groups have been using using opium for treating illnesses such as stomach diarrhea, 
or as a painkiller, and to ease work further. You'd begin to use drugs following their friends, while others resort to drugs to solve personal problems. Several drug users want to take up methadone therapy, but methadone therapy requires continuous treatment, which is a challenge for interested users. The distance between the, the ethnic, ethnic groups village in the use and the governmental methadone service. Most drug users are poor without vehicle, so regular long distance travel is a hard obstacle. Transportation can be costly and uh, public transport, transportation is not readable or available. The leads to the treatment discontinuation. The project Thai drug users network covering six districts of Chiang Mai. Outreach workers are ex or current drug users. Drug users are identified, educated about harm reduction, safe drug use, and drug harm towards oneself and family. HOV, STI, and Hep C. Clean equipment is offered to them too. Mobile telephone. Mobile methadone therapy service brings methadone to drug users at the village. Health service visit uh, the communities and provide the service with our uh, civil society staff. This reduces continuous treatment and help people who cannot travel to receive the treatment. Result in 2022, and. Uh, 18 clients received the methadone therapy from government health service, and 80% of whom were from ethnic groups. Some work on their farms while others are earning money to spend on their families. Some users reduce heroin injections from 5 per day to 2 or 1 per day. As a result, they had more money to spend on other things their health improved, and they had better family lives. Once drug users in the community began to have a better life, other drug users become modi became motivated to receive treatment too. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Nilawan. Um, next up, we have Courtney McKnight. Courtney is a clinical assistant professor, professor of epidemiology at New York University. Uh, Courtney will present some new and complex data on fentanyl trends. The data is under consideration with the International Journal of Drug Policy. Thank you, Naomi. Good morning, everyone. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to be presenting findings from an ongoing study that we are doing with people who inject drugs in New York City examining fentanyl use. Fentanyl, as you may know, is a highly, uh, highly potent synthetic opioid that has been added to the illicit drug supply in New York City and North America largely since um, for about 10 years. Uh, since its surface, it has caused precipitous increases in drug overdose mortality. Um, as you may know, in 2021, 100, over 107,000 people died from drug overdose deaths in the United States. In New York City, where this research took place, while we have had a steep increase in mortality since 2015, drug overdose deaths have increased by 80% additionally uh, since the COVID-19 pandemic began. Fentanyl is now involved in 80% of all overdose deaths in New York City. So in 2016, we started to investigate, as fentanyl sort of appeared on the scene, we started to investigate um, with people who use drugs whether or not they were aware of fentanyl and sort of their opinions of it. But given the fact that um, overdose has increased so much since that time, we decided to sort of revisit and see how people were feeling about fentanyl, what they knew about it, and also examine their exposure to it through urine toxicology testing and potential changes to, in preference for fentanyl. Um, so in this study, we conducted urine toxicology testing. We also did in-depth interviews as well as surveys. And what we found was 99% of our sample reported recent use of heroin, um, but only 40% tested positive for it. In contrast, 83% of people tested positive for fentanyl, but only 18% of people reported that they had intentionally used it. 
meaning that 78% of people in our study were in, not intentionally using fentanyl. When we examined differences between people who had intentionally used fentanyl versus those that hadn't, we found that people using fentanyl intentionally were more likely to be young, white, have overdosed at least once in the last six months, reported injecting more frequently, and self-reported fentanyl as their main drug. So given the ubiquity of fentanyl in the drug supply in New York, you can imagine that people are very concerned about overdose. 95% um, of people reported that they were using at least one harm reduction strategy to try and prevent an overdose event, but most people were reporting using multiple strategies at once. Uh, the most common strategies people were using were keeping naloxone nearby, um, using a smaller amount of drugs to try and gauge the potency of their drugs, um, using a trusted supplier to try and ensure consistency um, in the drug supply, and then using drugs with or near others so that in the event of an overdose, they could be uh, resuscitated. Our in-depth interviews that we conducted found that for many people who were using fentanyl intentionally, the ubiquity of it has really led to an increased tolerance that heroin alone or potentially heroin mixed with fentanyl um, may not be satisfying. So I just want to share with you one quote that really exemplifies this shift. So we, you know, in the in-depth interviews, we were asking people whether or not they prefer fentanyl. And one of our participants answered, now I do, yeah. If I see something too dark, I'm like, I don't want it. And by too dark, they're referring to heroin, which is sort of has a brown tint to it, as opposed to fentanyl, which is much more white. She says, I want the fentanyl because I get sick. Like I could do dope and still get the sweats. When I first got sick, I'm like, why am I getting sick and I'm still doing it? And then my friend's like, I think that's fentanyl. This quote came from a woman whose preference for fentanyl was uh, developed by repeated unknown exposure to it, which increased her tolerance and made heroin and potentially heroin mixed with fentanyl um, an undesirable option. She reported that she just wants to use straight fentanyl now and that she's able to get straight fentanyl. Our findings demonstrate that uh, fentanyl use was widespread in New York City, yet most people reported um, preferring and using heroin. Our findings um, also found that unsuspected fentanyl use and the persistent volatility in the drug supply uh, is putting people at significant risk for overdose, as evidenced by our mortality data. In 2021, over 2,600 people in New York City died of a drug overdose, and preliminary data indicate that this number is going to increase for 2022. So what do we recommend? Um, we need access to safe and a regulated drug supply, particularly for people whose tolerance continues to increase due to fentanyl, um, but also for people that are very concerned about overdose, which is the majority of folks uh, that we're talking to. We also need to increase access to naloxone as well as methadone and buprenorphine. And lastly, as Naomi mentioned, um, uh, you may be aware that two overdose prevention centers, um, the first two sanctioned overdose prevention centers in um, the United States opened in New York City in late 2021. But this, these programs are operating with private funding only. Uh, so we are urging our government, both uh, federal, especially federal, but as well as state governments, to provide support uh, for implementation as well as expansion of overdose prevention centers in the United States. Thank you. Thank you, Courtney. Such important work. Um, our final speaker today is Chris Goff. Chris is the CEO of the Canberra Alliance for Harm Minimization and Advocacy, also known as CAMHA. Last Friday, HRI took a group of local and Southeast Asian journalists to visit Kama's offices and the CanTest pill testing facility. Um, CamTest are one of the partners helping the operation to fulfill its mission. I know the journalists were blown away by the site visit and today Chris will give us a brief overview of the centre as well as provide an update on, on the latest uh, drug checking numbers produced by CanTest this week. Thanks. Thank you very much for having me. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting and pay respect to elders past and present. Um, I'm going to start by just giving a brief uh, rundown on uh, Karma as a service and uh, and what we've kind of done in the ACT and, and then I'll, I'll move on to um, uh, CanTest and, and the figures that have just come out. Um, so Karma is a, an integrated harm reduction service 
Uh, so very much a, a one-stop shop kind of a model. Um, we are a member of the um, Australian Injecting and Illicit uh, Drug Users League, and so there's a peer-based uh, organisation in, in almost every jurisdiction in Australia, and Canberra is represented by Karma. We run a community drop-in centre um, where we um, people can come, uh, have a cup of tea or coffee, uh, a meal, um, and that's all we ask of them. So there's no, there's no, you don't need to change. It's what we call a low threshold drop-in centre, uh, and so the idea is to start to build trust within our community and to grow. Everything we do at Karma is about community development. Um, so we also do a lot of uh, drug treatment support and case management, uh, as well as an naloxone program. We have a doctor and a nurse who in reach to us every week from Directions Health Services, who are the organisation that uh, runs CanTest in partnership with other organisations. Uh, and we have a point of care testing machine, which just turned up and we're part of a number of different uh, a number of different uh, research projects in Australia looking at the health and well-being of people who use drugs. Um, Karma probably sees about feeds about four to five hundred people every month at barbecues across the ACT and that's where we actually go out to people where, where they are. Uh, and we do that in partnership with Directions. So we provide um, peer treatment support workers who provide a community barbecue. Uh, and then next door to us, or, or in the same space as us, is uh, a clinical van which has a doctor and a nurse and a mental health uh, clinician. Uh, and so they're able to do um, vaccinations, uh, methadone and buprenorphine treatment, uh, hepatitis C treatment, uh, you know, and, and, and send people pretty much wherever they need to in the primary healthcare system. And so part of the idea of that is that we are out there uh, vouching for this wonderful service, uh, a doctor and a nurse. A lot of our community has had fairly appalling um, experiences with healthcare services. It has to, have, has to be said over the last kind of 30 years. Um, but slowly as things change and as, as society starts to um, accept people who use drugs, you know, we've been able to kind of move it along. Uh, and some of the policy we work we've done at Karma is um, we're very proud of. Uh, and so that includes uh, advocating to make cannabis properly decriminalised. Uh, and you're allowed to have 50 grams of cannabis now and grow up to two plants in the ACT, which has been fantastic. Um, there's also no police discretion, so it's simply part of the law that people can, can possess up to 50 grams of cannabis, which has had a significant impact on the stigma and discrimination that's felt by the community and a significant impact on the number of people who are coming forward uh, to seek treatment if they believe that their cannabis use has become problematic for them. So we really are strong believers in partnership and that brings me to wonderful CanTest. CanTest is Australia's first fixed site drug checking service. Uh, and again, it's a low threshold harm reduction service. So don't expect you to change. Uh, we just want to come say hello, uh, give you a great experience uh, and educate and inform you about what is in your drug sample. Um, CanTest is uh, run by directions. The peer workers, the uh, provided by Karma. Uh, Pill Testing Australia really did the heavy lifting in terms of uh, the advocacy for the service and continue to engage with governments around Australia about increasing the profile of uh, drug checking in Australia. Uh, and the ANU who provide the analytical uh, chemistry side of things, which is pretty complicated. Uh, so over the last month at CanTest, we've just released our, um, our eight month um, uh, uh, overview of, of what happened at the service in March this year. There were 91 samples uh, taken through our CAN test in March, bringing our total up to 789, so an average of almost 100, about 98, 98 samples every month. <clears throat> um, eight of those samples were discarded, uh, which is great, uh, and one community notice was released. And that was a, a red community notice we found uh, for fluoroamphetamine and 25C n bome uh, in a sample that was purported to be uh, 2CB. Um, so it's quite a dangerous uh, mixture 
those two. They're, 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 yeah, and, uh, and in 2017 in Victoria, they were responsible for a cluster of four deaths, or they were associated, I should say, and associated with, uh, with four deaths in the ACT. One of the things that's been great with CanTest is to actually give people an understanding of what they actually have. Uh, and <clears throat> we have we found that some drugs are more the supply is more stable than others. So, for example, methamphetamine supply is quite stable in in the ACT, but our ketamine supply certainly isn't. And so, if you look at the statistics from last month, there were 19 samples of ketamine sent in, and only 10 contained ketamine. The other the other nine samples contained a plethora of different chemicals. Uh, procaine, teletamine, MDMA, um, but also a, a range of different substances. So very important function of CAN test is actually letting people know what they really have and then uh, giving harm reduction advice to people to make sure that they can use it safely. Mm -hmm. uh, in particular, people are looking for how long is this drug going to take before it com comes on in my system? How long is the experience going to last? And, and what is it going to feel like? Um, and so these are fairly simple things, but they make the difference in a lot of cases between somebody knowing that they have to wait 40 minutes um, for their experience to come on and uh, uh, they make the difference between that and somebody becoming anxious because they're not feeling anything after 20 minutes and then redosing and redosing with the potential to overdose. Mm. Um, the other thing that's been fantastic about CanTest has been the uptake from the community, the way the community members describe the experience uh, as being very non-judgmental and the way that they go out and talk to their friends about the experience um, is forming this um, really beautiful uh, thing in the community where people are going out to festivals with their friends uh, and they're starting to have the right information uh, and resourcing to keep their mates safe uh, and and some of those and it's also I think having a profound effect on the way that people are viewing their own drug use uh, having that knowledge and centering the knowledge within the person has been uh, an amazing experience to see happen so thank you very much for your time fantastic thank you for being with us Chris um, really happy to open for questions now. Really happy to open for questions now. Um, any takers from the floor? Please, go first. Thank you. Sorry. <coughs> yeah. Um, my name is Anusha <coughs> Jaranpur. I'm coming from Thailand, the Bangkok Post newspaper. It is the only language English newspaper in Thailand, uh, just, just like we are the newspaper that looks like the middle of the world <laughs> when you go to Thailand. Okay, I have a question to Kun uh, Nilawan. Yes, yes uh, <coughs> I, as you know that the drug use and drug problems remain the serious problem in Thailand. Yes. And if you are in Thailand, we will uh, receive news about the heavy crackdown suppression of police authorities in Thailand every day. Uh, and would like to know in terms of the cooperation from the state, I'm very impressed with uh, your methadone, mobile methadone therapy uh, given through the remote drug user in Thailand because as you know that in the north of Thailand there are very high remote areas and it's quite inaccessible to, to travel to, to, to meet those people in the remote areas. And how much cooperation from the state that you uh, uh, that you held uh, is that said officers uh, facilitating uh, your project uh, I mean mobile uh, methadone therapy uh, in, in uh, during you start a project and and how is about the local community participation uh, they help you to run uh, this kind of project or not two questions okay. thank you all right <coughs> Thank you for question. Okay, uh, in uh, our project, before we uh, like uh, we do the project, we we have uh, like uh, uh, the meeting or seminar with uh, the local organi uh, organization and uh, the governmental organization in the local too. So uh, the 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 sector that uh, come to uh, join our project is uh, like uh, you know uh, hospital hospital in the the, the 
the local hospital and uh, and uh, uh, local uh, uh, governmental like uh, Obato, you know, yeah. yeah. Uh, he he he's come to join us too. And uh, for this, uh, about uh, the sector of uh, police, yeah, he mm, he come to uh, help us too because when our patient go to the hospital, the the police they have like a a. a Dan, Korea, when I sorry, I asked her. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we have uh, like uh, the po police sector, you know, uh, our clients need to pass uh, the sector, you know. So we should uh, tell, tell him that uh, today our clients go to the hospital, don't arrest him or don't taste anything in uh, his blood like that. So the police can help us too. Okay. So I think for yeah, uh, what you are doing, right? yes. So uh, for mm. our methadone therapy, we have uh, many sector in uh, many organization in uh, the areas help together. Not just civil society, governmental organization in the the local, very helpful for us. So I think this is the corporate. Uh, cooperate with between the government and civil society organization. Right. Yes. Okay, yes. Well. Yes. Mm. Thank you. Fantastic. Any other questions? Thank you. Code Blue. Hi, I'm Sulin uh, from Code Blue Malaysia. So um, I have a few questions for Marie uh, about your study. So my first question is, the health benefits um, that you cited in your study is it? narrowly defined to overdoses or reduction in uh, emergency room visits that's one um did you did your study measure for example compare the frequency of heroin injections or the number of people going on opioid therapy or also their general health hiv hcv status or mental health like uh, was there analysis of that and comparison between both groups um and i guess finally it seems like the main success of the um, the DCRs uh, in the in the French cities is it really public order rather than personal health because it seems like um, yeah the main benefits is fewer like you said uh, less disposal of uh, strangers everywhere in the city and um, fewer people injecting publicly that's it thank you Thank you for your question. Um, I had no time to detail the public health uh, result, and I will do it uh, this afternoon. So the benefits of drug consumption room were both in the both area. So we had a lot of benefits um, in, in the in health measures, but also a lot of benefits uh, in the public order uh, measure. So regarding your um, uh, your question on health uh, measure, we un unfortunately in, in this survey we uh, were not able to have a lot of mental health uh, indicators um, because we need to do the survey in a short period of time and we will implement uh, this year a new cohort survey that I will present this afternoon called the Bebop survey and this survey will be uh, focused on mental health. But the first one was a request from our government and they were interested by uh, overdoses, uh, infectious disease transmission and uh, public order uh, indicators. So uh, regarding the, the public health um, indicators, we have very, very, uh, a very good impact on reducing overdoses and also reducing the transmission of HIV and HCV by a measure that is uh, the paraphernalia and uh, injecting paraphernalia sharing. We were not able to collect biological data, so that's why all the measure of HIV and HCV that we have in this uh, study are declarative uh, status. We have other studies that are ongoing now with biological data uh, who will help us to continue to evaluate drug consumption rooms. There is um, a result that has, was not able to present now, but I will present it uh, this afternoon. It's on opioid substitutive therapy. And in France, we have a specificity, we have a paradox, because we have a very uh, prohibitive uh, regime, 
but we have also uh, a very high access to health. And uh, contrary to New York City or contrary to the United States, all the harm reduction services and all the drug treatment services are public funded. Mm -hmm and uh, it's not uh, funded by private sector. And that's why it is sustainable. And for opioid substitutive treatment, we, we are not able to show an increase in the access to opioid substitutive treatment because the level of access is very high. We have 85% of people in France who attend harm reduction services, so the group control, who are under opioid substitutive treatment. So the level is so high that it's difficult to have a higher um, access uh, even for people who attend uh, drug consumption rooms. But regarding, um, even if we have only one year of uh, follow-up, we, we were very happy with the, with the result on uh, overdoses, emergency uh, visits, abscesses, uh, and also with public order uh, measures that were expected from our government. Very useful insights. Thank you, Marie. I think we don't even have time for a last question, but if there is one, we can, we can cram it in. <laughs> Thank you, please. Compass. Thank you. I'm Effie. I'm from Compass Daily Newspaper from Indonesia. Uh, just one question about, uh, uh, we know as that many studies uh, that uh, give proof about uh, the, how effective the harm reduction to reduce, uh, to prevent uh, overdose and also the other, uh, all the transmission, uh, many uh, infection disease uh, like as uh, it's IV and hepatitis uh, C maybe. But uh, how uh, the data uh, used uh, for, for uh, the researcher and the civil society to push uh, the, maybe the policymaker to put uh, the harm reduction in the drug policy because in some country it's not uh, success to push the uh, policy maker to maybe is there is a harm reduction uh, program but not uh, in the massive uh, in the all, uh, all area uh, for example in Indonesia many is just concentrate in maybe just pilot project in one or two uh, city thank you yes uh, maybe for all or for Karen Yes. <laughs> I'm getting the hard one. <laughs> so, um, thank you for the question. Um, I do think it's a difficult question and a question that many people are struggling with. I think what we are trying to do in UNITAID is, first of all, make sure that you have the data. Because I, I hear you say that data is available but many of the data is from high income countries. And our experience at UNITAID at least has been that if you then present that data to a government in a low or middle income country and you try to use that data to encourage them to act the, the policies that we would like to see, they are going to say, yeah, but that's in France or that's in Australia or that's, you know, they have resources that we don't have. So it's easy for them to like, at least put the data in question, like, or saying the data is valid, but, but not in my country. So that is why, <coughs> excuse me, that is why, oh, it's getting it worse. Um, this is why the data, sorry. <coughs> that is why we think it is important to do work in low and middle income countries to get data from there. So at least it is more likely that the policy makers will believe it and will take it serious. But I do agree with you, it's not sufficient necessarily to have the data. So you also need to demonstrate the solution. So that is the other part that we are going to try to do. Not, not just show the problem, but show the solution, show the solution is working and is working in your country or if not in your country, at least in maybe a neighboring country, a country that is quite similar. And then I think the third element is also um, that we need to complement that also with the stories of the people themselves who have experienced mm -hmm. the problems and hopefully who have experienced the solution. So 
I didn't really highlight it in that way, but there is a lot of reasons why we believe that in our work, but I think many of the other speakers here said the same thing, why it is so important to involve the community. It is partly, of course, to make sure that the services are matching what they want and what they need. But I think the other part of it is also that the community can then be empowered also to talk to the government, either directly or through you people, like through the journalists, like listening to the community and also bringing out their stories and helping to reach the government. So I think that's a bit of a complex answer, um, but I think the situation is complex. But I also think it can be done. There are examples, and, and we've mentioned them, in high-income countries where the governments are starting to listen or are already listening for some time. But there are also examples in low- and middle-income countries. Like, I think a country like Ukraine, um, a country like Vietnam, they already have harm reduction programs and of course they can be improved also in my country it can be improved everything can be improved anywhere but we have examples of countries that are low and middle income country that already have good harm reduction programs and also and this is the last thing i will mm -hmm. say what i understand is that there are also slowly by little more and more low and middle income countries that at least are starting to think about creating a harm reduction program. And in the countries where UNITAID will work, we intentionally have a mix of some countries where there is already a pretty good harm reduction program, although maybe they have not done so much on hepatitis C, they have maybe more focused on other issues that are important and on HIV. But we also intentionally have some countries in there where the harm reduction program is, is only about to start because we think in those countries, maybe we can work with them to make the program comprehensive from the start. And yeah, hopefully in, I don't know, the next harm reduction <laughs> international conference or at least the one after that, uh, hopefully we will be able to share you very good results. Um, but for now, as I mentioned, the investment is new. Um, so um, we are just putting everything in place and we are getting going. Um, but we are very happy about that and yeah, hopefully other people as well. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, really useful. So please join me in thanking all our excellent panelists today. <laughs> Huge, huge amount of work goes into each and every one of these presentations, so I really encourage you to connect with the speakers. You all know our media consultant, Michael Kessler, and HRI's communications analyst, Suchitra Rajagopalan, so please reach out to them if you need any further contact. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.